everyone. Thanks for joining us with yet another OAS project spotlight series. And um, we have a very, very amazing project and a project leader with us. She's uh, one of our good friend, um, Katie Anton. Uh, we met a couple of years ago at one of the European conferences for OWASP. And uh, since then, we've been chit-chatting, meeting at almost every other conference and talking about different OWASP projects. So uh, today we are talking about one of the projects which is very close to her, and that's OWASP Proactive Controls. This project is very relevant in today's world, uh, today's uh, security system, when we are talking about uh, DevOps, DevSecOps, and uh, getting or attaining the security as early as possible. So let me welcome Katie so that she can uh, speak a bit about herself, and then we can talk a lot about the project. Katie, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me, Vandana. It's a real pleasure to join this series, Spotlights, uh, where you present some of the most amazing OWASP projects that we have as part of the OWASP Foundation that can be used uh, by the security community and the developers doing the software. So the project, my project, the, the one that I'm uh, closely involved into is the OWASP of Temporary Active Controls. Is, uh, a project that can help you defend your software. It's a, on the defensive, defensive side. It helps you defend your applications uh, and make them more robust from the start. So the project is, uh, if we are going to the leaders, Jim Manico has started the project some time ago in 2014, uh, which and then he was joined by uh, Jim Bird, and then I joined later into the 2016 version. Um, but um, it's not only the three of us. The great thing is that there are many people out there that actually contributed <coughs> um, to either the version or actually translated into multiple people, into multiple languages. The most recent one was the uh, translation into Italian uh, by Massimiliano Graziani, uh, which we thank them very much. Uh, and we can actually see here the translations which have happened over uh, the years. So we have Italian, Chinese, Russian, Polish for this version. Yeah, and if you fancy, uh, if you are listening to this uh, uh, podcast and you are interested to translate it in other languages, yeah, please contact uh, any of us uh, project leaders uh, to see of how you, we can do that one. But ideally, we'd like to have more of these translations in more languages. Kitty, one more question around, uh, like when we talk about uh, these top 10 proactive controls, I can see that they are very different from the OWASP top 10. So how are they different from it? And uh, what's unique about uh, the proactive controls? Yes, so this would be um, actions that developers can take into their software mm -hmm. when writing their code to help them prevent those common vulnerabilities. So if, for example, uh, one of the OS top 10 is be aware of uh, components with known vulnerabilities. We have here uh, leverage security frameworks and libraries. So this would be on the premise that it's better to use a library that has been designed uh, with security in mind from the beginning, especially cryptographic libraries or other more, diffi uh, more difficult libraries like um, contextual encoding to prevent the cross-site mm -hmm. scripting. So those can be very difficult to be done from the scratch. So it's better to use mm -hmm. those components into your uh, code. But what we also advise, we have some uh, um, recommendations of once you bring those into how to bring those into the code to actually be able to upgrade them or replace them easily. Uh, but once you have them in a code to keep an eye on them, monitor them and upgrade them, replace them in order to avoid the common vulnerabilities, the mm -hmm. uh, 
of having the components with known vulnerabilities. So is this type of thing of what you need to do as a developer in the code to actually put, uh, avoid and if I am uh, probably uh, so the list is ordered um, based on what we think it are the most important or based on the importance. So you should start with defining the requirements um, and then reusing libraries which have been designed with security in mind secure database access that is when you interact with your storage mm -hmm. um, contextually encode output data then validate the input increment uh, implement digital identity this is about uh, protecting the uh, identity of your users authentication access controls, uh, protect data everywhere, which means, which includes both data at rest and in transit. Um, security more uh, logging and monitoring, which is, which is something that we have introduced in this version, the 2000, uh, in 2016 actually was uh, that one um, introduced. And we started talking about the importance of when you write a code and there is an exception, so it should be at that point, that exception log. And uh, it's not only us saying, but uh, we also recommend to use an, another OWASP project, which is the app sensor. And as part of that project, which is uh, has two parts, one is the documentation and another one, the tool. We are focusing on the documentation. And as part of that documentation, there are some certain type of intrusion detection points which can be used in order to decide uh, to log those uh, events to have uh, these logs into your, uh, recorded into your logs and then aggregate it to give you a better understanding of what's happening out there and in um, help you out to detect suspicious activity and then as well uh, handle all the exceptions. So now going back to those uh, 10 um, recommendations, 10 security controls that can be used by developers. So we said about uh, defining the security requirements. One way we can do this is to actually augment the requirements with user stories and misused cases. So developers are used to use uh, use cases. This would be of how the software, the system should behave when a user interacts with that particular system. But at the same time, in the same story, they can also uh, start writing misuse cases. This would be of how the system should behave or when an attacker tries to uh, uh, abuse that system and uh, which is basically what the system uh, should do in order to deny the attacker accomplishing that goal. So th that's something that can be done. And if this is done, the use of both use cases and misuse cases, when they write their user story, we actually bring the security into the design stage. Um, clarifying these requirements early on. Then the other one is, uh, we, which we said about those components. Um, and one of the things when we bring another library is to actually bring it in such a manner that it's easy to maintain that is upgrading, but if something happens with that particular library, um, then you can easily up, up, replace it without much penalty. And this can be achieved using software design patterns which developers are used or familiar to. So if we combine the uh, knowledge from the software development, in particular, the software design patterns, uh, and bring it into when we use uh, these components, we can achieve the goal of actually having software which is more secure because it uses libraries which have been designed with security in mind from the beginning, but also 
we are, are able to stay on top of those. When storing data into the database, a parameter tries the queries every time any data uh, should be contextually up encoded, uh, and the contextual part is very important as well. Uh, and any value input should be validated. And uh, as you can see, I have there um, an arrow coming from the database. So uh, the database is also important to be considered as an untrusted source because sometimes, I mean, it, you don't know what, uh, what else is stores data into that database or how can be tainted. So from a security point of view, in order to be um, safe, we should validate the, the input, the data coming from that database in particular, in the case of more complex queries uh, where you use that data into then uh, a new SQL um, command. And, and I've seen lots of applications out there where the developers will have this dynamic query and it can be quite complicated where in order to be easier for them to kind of manage, uh, they decide to put a part into a part like tables or columns into either a configuration file or a database and then use those directly into the SQL command. That's a case where you sh we should validate that data coming either from a configuration file or a database. Uh, because there is a chance to be tainted. So that would be uh, the other one. And we talk a little bit more in detail into the project about this. The other, the next one is securing the data and that would be data at rest uh, to ensure that your key, the key used uh, to encrypt or decrypt the data at rest is stored in a secure manner in a key management solution ideally or TLS, that would be uh, data when it's transferred. And as well, I put it there, um, the communication over a secure channel, TLS, ideally 1.2, should be done also between the application and the um, other components, like for example, the database, which usually sits behind the power. So it's important to be consistent basically. And another one is the log exceptions. So any validate, we, the data entered your application, you apply, uh, you validate that data, which enters the application. But then this is when it comes important that any logs, any exceptions should be logged in a manner to give the software this mechanism to prevent a real time um, possible, um, attacks and depending of how we decide the software to behave, which is at that uh, point when we write the code, then we can either um, stop those attacks or uh, just uh, reduce the impact. It's a decision of what, how we decide to, the software to behave. So this is uh, probably a more concise um, um, way to and probably uh, to actually implement these security controls into the software development and perhaps is uh, something more familiar but to developers because you can kind of see okay I have the data entering the uh, application data parameterized in code uh, store uh, the secrets in a secure manner and hopefully more and more developers will use it if it is presented in a how to say more concise way uh, more into their language absolutely i totally agree with you now um this one thing you talked about now we understand this is where we can find the project and this is the project is um so uh, do we have a github repo for uh, proactive controls where they can go ahead and start contributing it is under the OASP, even if you don't know it, you can go into the OASP uh, um, GitHub and there you can see all the projects and then type into the search, the proactive, I, uh, very easy. So this is where it is uh, 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 residing. If you mm -hmm. fancy uh, uh, participating, then it's very easy to use GitHub uh, by creating uh, a pool, then do your changes. Um, <clears throat> by forking the, uh, for, forking the repository to your changes and then make, make the pull request. So this is a, that's very easy to actually contribute to the project. 
thank you so much i think they will, uh, this is really really helpful and uh, anyone who wants to contribute to make sure that you reach out to uh, katie anton or you uh, fork the github repo and suggest your changes be it through code be it through content anything will be really helpful and the people who are listening and who wants to donate to a project please go ahead and donate to the project so thank you so much katie for joining us today and sharing the very valuable insights and especially around um, the the whole project scenario how this can help uh, the developers thank you very much for inviting me vandana i really appreciate it <laughs> yeah and looking forward to connecting with you in um, many more future projects around owasp thanks a lot yeah thanks everyone for jo- for listening to the uh, session today and see you soon in the next one take care have a good day